Pennsylvania, Latin for Penn's Woods and named after William Penn, is a section of land that lies almost entirely between the 40th and 42nd parallels and between the longitudes of 74.5 and 80.5. In this 29 and a half million acre box is a diverse landscape with tens of thousands of plants, trees, animals, and geologic features. And although the earth has undergone many changes since creation, it is all still a testament to the grand creator. During the third week of September, the sun sits above the equator, giving the northern hemisphere equal hours of daylight and night, starting a chain reaction that affects everything from weather to plants and animals. Over the next 12 weeks, the landscape will undergo drastic changes and become almost unrecognizable. Everything will kick into overdrive and prepare for the survival of what is to come. Join us in awe at the wild and natural wonders of Pennsylvania. Deep within the Allegheny Mountains of north-central Pennsylvania, giants stir. Weighing nearly half a ton, this species needs to eat a lot in order to mate and to bulk for winter. The bull elk will eat its body weight and vegetation in one month, or nearly 30 pounds a day. It is currently the largest deer species in North America, after the moose. Its antlers alone can weigh up to 40 pounds. The elk today are not the native species that roamed these mountains and hills just 150 years ago. The eastern elk, or wapiti, used to live in great numbers. This now extinct species was much larger than the elk here today. Its range extended to nearly every state east of the Mississippi and large chunks of Canada. By the 1850s, over one million square miles of habitat was destroyed by settlers and they hunted the elk down to less than 1% of their original numbers. And just two decades later, the last confirmed wild eastern elk was killed near the Clarion River in 1877, although rumors of their existence in Canada and Minnesota continued into the late 1890s. In 1880, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service declared them extinct. 33 years later, President Teddy Roosevelt had arranged for 50 Rocky Mountain elk from Yellowstone National Park to be brought over by train. And today, PA's elk herd numbers around 1,400 and spreads over 1,000 square miles. By the fall equinox, the elk are nearing peak rut. If they are not eating, they are performing mating rituals. The males start by tearing up the ground while putting on cologne. By soaking himself in pee, he covers himself in a scent that only a female elk would love. 
Then they sniff and taste the air to see if there are any females nearby. And if another bull gets too close, they will stand off for the right to mate with a harem or group of female elk. Even the youngsters practice for when they grow up. In the victor, will breed with 20 to 30 cows. High upon remote mountain ledges, moms across the Commonwealth are ready to give birth. The first week of September is when many species of reptiles and amphibians begin to give birth. The timber rattlesnake is no exception. It is one of three venomous species in the state, and the largest of the three. For the past several months, the females didn't do much but lay in the sun. They've been capturing every bit of sun in order for their babies to develop well. The timber rattlesnake, after 11 to 13 months of being gravid, will finally give live birth to 3 to 18 babies called neonates. Each is 8 to 10 inches long and has a diameter of a nickel. The mother will stay close for the first 10 days, long enough for the babies to develop venom and shed. When a creature gets too close to her or her babies, she will give warning to back off. Weighing nearly five pounds at three feet long, she hits hard with her one and a quarter inch fangs, and she is able to strike two thirds of her body length. The rattlesnake gives warning by shaking its segmented tail, which is made from keratin, or the same material as our fingernails. Although vulnerable, the neonates have a secret weapon, camouflage. When they are born, they are colorless, with varying hues of gray, blending in with the sandstone outcroppings, 
making them nearly impossible to see by predators above and below. It takes nearly a full year for them to develop into the recognizable timber colors. The adults fall under two categories of color, known as black or yellow phase. Each stays the same color for life and has a unique color pattern. No two snakes are exactly the same, just like our fingerprints. The sure way to identify if it is a yellow or black face is to look at the eyes. Blacks have black eyes and yellows have yellow. Contrary to popular belief, each segment known as a button does not correlate to a year. Each time a rattlesnake sheds its skin, it grows another segment. It's born with a pre-button, and for the first two years of life, it'll shed three to four times a year. For the rest of its life, it'll shed once or twice a year. Eventually, segments wear or break off. The timber rattler's smaller cousin, the northern copperhead, will commonly share basking sites with the garters and timbers. After their first shed, the neonates have to grow up and learn to fend and hunt for themselves. They will have to fight for food and against predators until they are safe underground at the winter den. They surprisingly have a number of predators, including vultures, hawks, coyotes, weasels, and other snakes. In the meantime, they practice the life skills taught to them. Many trees will change color by the last week of September in the Laurel Highlands and the northeastern part of the state. It is also around the time of the first major frost within the borders. 58% of Pennsylvania is currently forested, equating to roughly 17 million acres. The fall season in the Keystone State is one of the most colorful and long-lasting of the entire planet. It starts in the northeast and six to seven weeks later in November, it ends in the southeast. This extraordinary display of color could be attributed to the varied climates within the state borders and the fact that the state is a meeting ground of northern and southern species. From the coastal plains and forests in the southeast to the glacial carved mountains of the north, to the deep valleys of the northern Alleghenies, to the highlands of the southwest, and the ridge and valley region of the interior. Pennsylvania boasts more than 134 species of native trees.
PA's nearly 7 billion trees will drop an astonishing 849 and a quarter trillion leaves. So many leaves, in fact, that if stacked, would make a tower from the sun to Mars. The weight of said leaves is equivalent to the total weight of every stone in the entire Great Wall of China, times 45. The leaves will decompose over the next two years and send nutrients back to the trees and plants of the forest floor. Trees will change different colors based on the chemicals that break down within. Chlorophyll is the chemical that gives leaves the basic green color. Carotenoids will produce yellows, oranges, and browns, and anthocyanins produce reds and purples. As daylight decreases, chlorophyll production slows to a halt, and the other chemicals take over. Certain colors are characteristics of particular species of trees. Oaks will have red to brown leaves. Aspens, poplars, birches, and hickories will have varying shades of golden yellow. Gum trees are associated with crimsons and purples. Maples, depending on the species, will vary from scarlet to orange to yellow. Different tree species will begin to change color at different times. Gum trees can start in September, whereas the oaks can hold the green hues until late October. The vibrancy of colors also depends on a number of factors that happen throughout the entire year, such as rainfall, temperatures, and humidity. For the best colors, a recipe of a warm, wet spring, a warm and humid but not extremely hot summer, and the wet fall with warm days and cool nights is needed. While the Northeast has already started to change colors, the South is still green with fruits ready to drop. These green skin, kidney-shaped fruits are known as pawpaws. The pawpaw tree is a second canopy tree that can be found on the banks of warm sections of large rivers and their major tributaries. The trees are easily recognizable
with their large tropical-like leaves and skinny trunks. Southeastern PA has the largest population of pawpaw trees in the northeastern United States. During this time, a variety of mushrooms can be found, such as chicken of the woods, lion's mane, and rishi. These mushrooms work together with the trees, shrubs, and plants of the forest. They form on sick and dying trees and help decompose them sending the tree's nutrients back into the forest floor for the next generation. At the same time, the mushrooms provide sustenance to many micro-animals and insects, which then in turn help decompose leaves and other forest litter, also sending nutrients back into the earth. Apple trees can also be found fruiting. Many of the apples that are found today are left over from Johnny Appleseed. High up on the mountain streams near the headwaters like these, a master builder begins construction. Weighing in at 35 to 70 pounds, the North American beaver is the world's second largest rodent. Its webbed feet and rudder-like tail make it an expert swimmer. Its most notable feature is its large, amber-colored teeth. The color is due to the high iron content, making them extra strong. Their teeth never stop growing, so its remedy is to wear them down on trees. Construction starts by gathering timber the beaver is able to chew through a six inch diameter tree in less than 10 minutes and a much larger tree in less than several hours. As it chews through the trunk, it'll stop and listen for the wood fibers breaking under its own weight. If there's no noise, it continues to chomp away. Once the fibers start creaking, it'll let the wind take care of the rest. All the hard work calls for a snack, the wood itself. Day and night, the beaver will gather stones and stack them underwater, and then sticks. It weaves the sticks together for the walls and the roof. Some of the sticks will be buried in the mud at the bottom of the stream, acting as a storehouse for food during the winter when the water freezes over. By damming the water, it creates a new local ecosystem. The area becomes flooded, providing the habitat for thousands of plants, reptiles, amphibians, birds, fish, and even mammals. The dam also acts as a natural filtration device. Water still passes through the dam but at a much slower rate, allowing the aquifers to replenish. Any pollutants become filtered through the mud and the dam walls, and the bacteria and microorganisms break the pollutants down, making the water even cleaner. Beavers are an essential part of PA's overall ecosystem. They create a habitat that's used by more than one third of all PA species of plants and animals. Not bad for a rodent. By the second week of October, the high elevations of the Laurel Highlands explode into color like nowhere else. The Southwest Mountains alone have 134 species of trees and hundreds of shrubs and plants that add to it. People from all over the planet come to the Laurel Highlands to see the majestic display of leaves.
right before the first heavy frost, the timber rattlesnakes spend the last days of the year at the basking sites. The few weeks they've been alive, the surviving neonates have shed twice. Once they leave the basking sites for the winter den, they are completely independent. The winter dens are also a communal location below the frost line, usually in the base of the cliff from the basking site. From birth to spring of next year, more than half the neonates will have succumbed to predation and starvation. Gentle critters you commonly find this time of year are salamanders. Many of PA's 22 salamander species live in or near clean, fresh water mountain streams. In a few weeks, not long after the first frost, they will burrow themselves deep underground and stay there until spring to avoid being frozen. Salamanders are a great indicator of healthy streams, for their skin is highly absorbent. Any pollutants in the water would quickly kill them. Back up in the PA wilds, the elk rut is pretty much over. Most of the cows have been bred and the focus shifts to resting and bulking for winter. The PA Wilds is not only famous for elk and other wildlife, but also for dark skies. This two million acre section of undeveloped land lays claims to the darkest skies in the state and almost anywhere east of the Mississippi. During a new moon on a cloudless night, we have one of our last opportunities until spring to see the heavens in their full glory. With very little light pollution, the stars give off enough light to see without a flashlight, and the Milky Way is visible to the naked eye. With the cold, the familiar drone of insects have disappeared, and the only noises that can be heard are the calls of owls and a few other animals that will remain during the winter. A few times every 11 years, we get an extra treat of the northern lights, and maybe even a comet or two.
During autumn, the jet stream changes and brings in heavier rains, swelling many mountain streams with their numerous cascades and creating new ephemeral feeder streams. During the first month of fall, nearly half a trillion gallons of water will fall from the sky in the Laurel Highlands alone. That's enough water to fill 758,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools, or enough to fill the Allegheny Reservoir. Pimatuming Reservoir Racetown Lake, and the Yakuagini River Lake. The trees don't call for much water because of dropping their leaves. Thus, the water levels take longer to recede. Rivers increase to 300% of their summertime volume. The calm waters become violent, and the violent waters become ferocious. river and lake islands disappear, and anything upon the sand will be washed away. These high waters pull nutrient-rich soil and plants with seeds downstream to sow elsewhere. Coming up in the spring, These rains also bring the last blooms of the year. The first fall rains kick off a long journey for a certain animal. Starting from one of the world's largest freshwater lakes, the steelhead trout comes inland up the streams. Steelhead trout weren't always in Pennsylvania waterways but were introduced in the 1880s from California and have been thriving ever since. Over one million stillhead will attempt the journey upstream.
here, they reach their first obstacle, a small rapid. They fight against the current, but sometimes the current fights back harder. One last obstacle is also the hardest, a small cascade. Eventually, they make it past the falls a few miles upstream in the clear shell bed creeks, hanging out in deeper pockets. But for some, the journey was too much, and they died from exhaustion. The rest will remain in the creeks throughout fall and winter to spawn. During the spring rains, they will ride the current back out to the lake. While the northeast and the highlands of the southwest reached prime color and is starting to drop most of its leaves, the rest of the state is ready for time in the spotlight. Since the southeast is closer to the Atlantic with its extremely low elevation, it averages 18 to 23 degrees warmer than the highest elevations in the west and north central. Temperatures and the Allegheny Mountains vary from day to day and throughout the day, often dropping 40 degrees from day to night and changing 40 degrees from day to day. The extreme temperature differences and rain causes fog most days, blocking the sun and making the temperatures even cooler.
It's during this time the animals of the forest really prepare for winter. Gray squirrels. Red squirrels. And eastern chipmunks will gather as many fruits and nuts as possible and store them in nests, dens, or in the forest floor. Enough to at least make it until spring. The native brook trout will mate and lay eggs. Nutrients from the leaves and trees along the stream will sink to the bottom of deeper pockets of the stream, providing food during the winter for when the streams freeze over. Face hornets finish building and insulating their nests. Bobcats will roam the forest taking advantage of all the squirrels and chipmunks out gathering nuts. Predatorial birds sit in tree branches, watching for small mammals and fish to move below. Late October, a special tree makes itself known. During spring and summer, it looks like a normal tree. But during the fall and winter, it looks almost diseased or dead. The American larch, also known as the tamarack, is a conifer that sheds its needles like a deciduous tree. The high elevation bogs of Pennsylvania, Maryland, and West Virginia is the southernmost habitat of this species. Very few of them have survived Pennsylvania's extensive logging history. Around the third week of October, in the highest elevations of the southwest and northern tier, the rain changes over to snow, covering the remaining foliage, putting on a rare and dazzling display, a clash of seasons, and the start of a battle that lasts half a year. Cold air from Arctic Canada and Russia's Siberia versus the warm, moist air of the tropics north versus south, with the north usually gaining the upper hand. By November, few trees have leaves remaining, mainly some oaks and trees in the extreme southwest corner of the state. And by now, the whole state has experienced frost. Water temperatures in the mountain streams drop down 
the 39 degrees, and larger rivers, the 46. The chilly waters change colors due to the molecules coming closer together and the nutrients that fell off trees allow less light to penetrate. Creeks will turn dark green and rivers will turn dark blue or green to black. At the end of fall, much of the state is covered in snow, and many of the lakes and streams are beginning to freeze. Daylight is shortened to just nine hours, with the sun barely above the horizon. Food will become scarce, and the temperatures will continue to plummet. Starting the true test of survival. <laughs> 